Welcome to Trust Talks and Digital Dives, where we delve into the world of trust in the digital age. Trust Talks and Digital Dives is produced by DIAC, a nonprofit organization that fosters secure and privacy enhancing access to digital services in Canada and globally. Whether you're navigating the complexities of data privacy, pondering the impact of AI on trust, or curious about how technology shapes our relationships, you're in the right place. This episode focuses on women in leadership in digital trust and identity. You'll hear a conversation between myself and Fadwa Moana, who is CEO and founder of 137. 137 delivers a suite of digital trust building blocks, providing the highest level of security and privacy for businesses and consumers. 137 are also one of our amazing DIAC members who are committed to building digital trust, privacy, and security using user centered design. And Fadwa, well, her drive and pragmatic optimism sets a leadership example that truly inspires me. So let's dive into digital trust with Fadwa. Welcome, Fadwa. Um, it's great to have you join us uh, for our conversation today that's focusing on um, women in leadership from our DIAC community. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to hear a little bit about your journey in the space. Welcome today. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny, for having me. And I always welcome the conversation with you anytime. <laughs> so, um, with that, uh, for our audience, um, Could you share for our listeners a little bit about your background and your career journey and what brought you to 137? I would love to. So uh, my career started as a computer and communications engineering. And this is really where I spent the first 15 years of my corporate life. I gained tremendous valuable field experience. So I was on site installing antennas and putting shelters and transmission equipment. But also this is where I developed leadership skills by managing large teams on site through very hectic deadlines and uh, under pressure to, to put telecom, telecom operations online. And with time, I progressed through various roles and responsibilities that really led me to becoming eventually uh, leaving the corporate life and becoming an entrepreneur. Um, of course, just like everybody else, I, I did encounter a lot of challenges and obstacles throughout both the corporate life and the entrepreneurship life. But I think those are the type of uh, experiences that definitely shape who we are and make us uh like definitely who we become. Yeah, it's it's so interesting to hear. And, and you know, I, I we, we believe that uh, women and leaders in this space can come at all ages and all, all shapes and sizes. And so um, I wonder if you can think back to when you were 20 years old, when you were, you know, before you were maybe uh, in your formal career, um, did you have a dream job? And what did your dream job look like if you did? Yeah, so, you know, I grew up watching those geek shows that showed these nerds typing frantically on their computers. So definitely the dream was to become a computer engineer. And as I started my studies and I learned, I became even more passionate about both the hardware part, so building computers from scratch, as well as the programming part, so writing software programs. It wasn't until my fourth year that I got introduced to the telecommunications part of it. And this like blew my mind. And I did see in a glimpse, like this is gonna be the future. And I decided then to focus specifically on telecommunications engineering. And this is where, what was exactly where I headed on my first job straight after graduating. Yeah, I love the telecommunications angle as well because it 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 evokes visions of interconnectedness and and I I can see how that would be inspiring the potential that's brought about by that interconnectedness. So it's fascinating to hear that when you were 20 years old your computer engineering was in your sights as a dream job. I love it. Um so it's been <laughs> Um, very geeky <laughs> very geeky perfect um and we mean geek in a in a very positive way here um so through your career um 
have you or did you inc- uh, did you encounter barriers along the way and and if so you know what was that experience like and, and how did you go through the, them yeah so look understandably the answer is yes so uh definitely tons of barriers um where i started my career was also a uh, part of the world where it wasn't typical for women to be on site with technicians installing antennas. So I, my first job was in Egypt. From there on, I went to Morocco, then Algeria, then Tunisia, and eventually the UAE. And in all those, it was very heavy operations, building telecom operations, greenfield operations. So when we, would we arrive, there would be nothing, no operations at all. By the time we left, everybody had a phone and was already communicating. So the barriers for myself across all those six operations was the uh, the common, which mean lack of representation. Being the only woman in the room, uh, although it's always said, but it is true, it was the norm for me rather than the exception. There was no female leader that was a, a CTO nor that was a CEO wherever I went. And I was part of the CTO, if you want, uh, environment as head of deployment, head of network rollout. Uh, There was no woman, simply. I would always be the only woman in the room. Now, to my surprise, I noticed recently that things haven't changed much. So uh, I was just checking some pictures of recent events, and I realized that in a lot of those, I was still the only woman in the room. So although 25 years have passed, uh, the same lack of representation is still a common problem. And it still, I believe, is a barrier to all the females, uh, female engineers, females in in tech or in security or in digital identity. I do believe we have a big problem. And we're very lucky to have you, Johnny, as uh, a great model for DIAC. Uh, However, I do believe that's the exception and that's not the norm right now. Yeah, one hundred percent. Certainly, there's there's more to be done. Um, and, and this is you know diversity of representation. I would say is a process over time. I can say for sure in my career as well. Yes, there there was very few women in the room, particularly uh, in the in and around the software engineers. So uh, yeah, th- this is something that we all need to continue to work at. And you're setting an example um, through your leadership. And and I'm just so honored to work with um, you know leaders like yourself who keep me inspired and keep me keep me going forward. Now um, I wonder as well uh, if you have uh, do you have and if so, can you share advice about balancing work and life responsibilities do you are you able to strike a balance there and if so do you have some advice for us yeah so before I answer that maybe I'll just note a second problem and then I'll segue into this reply so maybe the in the question about typical challenges other than lack of representation there was also a huge gender bias so a typical example was not being offered technical training. In the times I was more on the technical side of the field work, it was in a way not never said loudly, but it was understood that I would never be offered formal technical training because it was kind of assumed that if I got married and then I would leave the company immediately and that that training would be a loss and so investing in a male engineer was in a way the safer bet and offered a higher ROI on the training rather than offering it to me so this is something I met all the time and uh, of course as a typical woman the way we women typically behave is that we double down we try to do to pull the all nighters and train ourselves and and in a way doing the training by asking tons of questions and this was also a kind of something i met throughout my whole career and the reason why i'm mentioning this is to answer your next question how do you achieve balance and life responsibilities uh, in this environment so You have lack of representation, you have gender bias, but at the same time, you have a life and you want to achieve balance. 
And in a way, I had reached, you know, the the same the same conclusion as you know Oprah famously said, you can have it all, just not all at once. And the reason the reason why this resonated with me a lot is that I did have this kind of like having 15 years of my life just dedicated to advancement in career, training myself, pulling all-nighters, which in all honesty would not have made it possible for me to have also a family life. So I did have a very accomplished corporate life at one time, but I had made peace with it. I had made peace that this is a part of my life where I am investing heavily in my technical growth, in my learning, in my corporate advancement and then dedicating other portions of my life to family. So I did had the kind of peace with that, is that everything had to have its time in order for me to do the maximum in a, in a, in a, in a short of time. This, of course, is not maybe applicable to everybody, but this was what worked for me, is to dedicate kind of sections of my life to certain portions. So what was career, then it was family, and then eventually finding a balancing act between two and combining career with entrepreneur family with entrepreneurship and this is kind of the balance i am at right now yeah it's interesting uh i think you know what you're sharing is around some of the differences between uh first off having that diversity of representation that we have the same or that we have a distribution of that diversity in the room, which is different than the equitability that we're being offered the same opportunities and that we're, we're able to participate um, in an equitable way uh, along with others who are, who are in that space. Um, I love the, I think there are many women leaders and, and, and probably all of us, but particularly women, especially in, in terms of family and home life, uh, looking at it in terms of segments and, and, and have it all, but not all at once. It's great advice. Uh, so I appreciate that you, you've shared this approach and that it's something that worked for you on, on your way forward for people to consider. Um, I would say staying along with the, <clears throat> um, strategic view on, um, you know, maybe taking that segmented approach and maybe back to the beginning on kind of who was in the room when you came into your career. Um, do you have advice on how more women can be encouraged through the pipeline, through their growth and education to be a part of the digital trust and identity um, professional ecosystem? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I Definitely, there are many ways I would love to see more women pursue career in digital identity in the technology and security space. And there is two ways is that, yes, we let it happen naturally, and this can take hundreds of years at the rate we're going, or doing it very consciously. I am a proponent of the second, is that there is today still a huge imbalance you know, about the numbers, uh, the numbers speak louder than anything else. I mean, the percentage of women in corporate, in top 500, in security, in technology, in digital identity, the number, the percentage of women uh, holding uh, seat positions, I think is still very, very, very um, less than 20%, which means that we're still having a huge imbalance. Now, there are many techniques to to balance. No, we need to reach a 50-50. And to reach 50-50, for me, is a constant conscious strategies, whether it's mentorship, educational initiatives, uh, encouraging diversity and inclusion, but very consciously. And even if it felt, to be honest, Johnny, over the last few years that, you know, there has been so much programs for promoting women, women in security, women identity. And like you felt, well, we've done a lot already. The numbers would have changed by now. I, I did this work recently and I discovered the numbers haven't changed much, which does it mean that those programs didn't work? No, in my opinion, those programs are working, but the huge imbalance was already so high that you need much more time to balance it. And that, these changes take time. So it the funnel itself, 
like people need to be coming from STEM and the number of students enrolling in programs leading to security and digital identity and technology that originally the funnel need to be balanced. So how many are enrolling in college and the studies and then how many are adopting those careers? And this is why it's taking so much time. It doesn't mean that all the initiatives are not working. It just means that for us to start witnessing at towards a numbers towards 50-50 will require much more time than a few years. Now, uh, some of the work, which exactly what you're doing, Johnny, right now is like showcasing successful female role model, like having much more representation, constantly shining the spotlight, maybe not only around, you know, women uh, day, but any day, like having a monthly spotlight on women, having this very visible encouragement for women to join all those careers and having constantly a model in front of them, this is what I believe would work, like a constant perseverant work towards promoting women in those, not stopping until the numbers reach what we believe is a 50-50. Yes, it's interesting. I was listening to another media outlet and they were talking similarly about um, women in executive positions as uh, TV and film productions. And they were saying similar that uh, even though oh, there's been so much work on the visibility and the amplification and communication around diversity um, in the workplace and leadership, uh, needing that diversity and leadership in the workplace, the numbers are not there. And so, yeah, I think it's I think it's a really important point that um, the work that we're doing to amplify and showcase and raise up those uh, profiles is important. Um, and we need to keep pushing, 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 uh, because what we want to see is the results in the data that we that we've achieved, that we're achieving um, that parity and that representation in the workplace. So I think this is a really important point within our industry and within others. We we can't get um, doing the work to communicate it is is part of the picture and not the whole picture. So we haven't totally achieved what we're looking for yet. And we have to do more. But also, let's remember that this imbalance took hundreds and thousands of years to happen like gender bias the role of women what women are supposed to do the expectation of women all of these took hundreds of years to set in so for us to rectify this huge imbalance we cannot achieve it in like you know small five years or 10 years window right so the imbalance took so much time and it will require not hundreds of years hopefully but i still believe we have like a good decade to be promoting women constantly, monthly, daily, in order to start seeing a, an impact. Fantastic. And and in the concept of promoting women, um, so so we've been discussing that representation across it within the industry and the professional space. What about advice on how uh, women can also move into more leadership roles? Um, so so there's the representation that at all the levels, but also how do we do you have any advice on helping uh, whether it's for women or for organizations or both on helping women to move into more prominent leadership roles? You know, my my major, if you want uh... Uh, um, uh, kind of uh, moment of of oh of or moment of uh, reflection was for this to really work, it has to be around designing programs for women by women. So I noticed different strategies across different corporations, and in my opinion, for this really to work to to advocate properly for gender equality and providing you know, leadership opportunities for women, all these programs that are currently being designed, they have to be designed by women for women. They have to understand the cycle of life that women go through and meeting them where they are. So women have to, have to certain cycle. There is a certain number of years and there is children in the equation, having children, seeing them to their, their early years uh, until they go to school, then going back to corporate life, then maybe, you know, getting their best opportunities after 50 and reaching their maximum potential between 
you know, 50 and 60, and then, you know, becoming much more because then there would, they would have accumulated, they would have had their family set and they would have had now a clearer, if you want, uh, vision. And I do believe that understanding women's cycle of life is key to designing programs for women. And, it, and like, definitely there are men out there that are supporting women. I'm, I'm not saying there are no men. There are a lot of men supporting women. I do believe just like these programs and all the equality program and the inclusion program need to be designed by women. Those have would, in my opinion, have the most impact on addressing the imbalance and the uh, barriers for women today to stop leaving uh, work, to stop you know, leaving as soon as they have families and then when to come back and how to integrate and adapt all the changes in their life and keep growing within organizations. Yeah, I, lo I love this. And and I, I think in some of the Nordic countries too, they, they really encourage that both men take the leave and, you know, fathers and mothers take the leave at different times. And so there's um, in the case, you know, in that case, it's not only one person is taking leave, for example. So uh, I love the the, the four women um, by women approach. Completely see the value and 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 the benefits of of this approach forward. And I also love that you touched on the years from fifty and up. Um, I was having a conversation with somebody just yesterday and they were saying, well, you know, it's difficult to make changes after the age of 50. And I thought, mm, I, I'm not sure that that's true anymore. I think I think really some of these um, constructs are, are what we make of them. And so we're living lives now in 2024 than maybe um, past generations. And, and we do have more time and more ability. So we shouldn't limit ourselves to um, only certain periods where we can make certain successes and really think beyond that. So I think this is all <clears throat> fantastic advice. Um, what would you say for the women who are coming up in the next generation? What do you think some of their biggest challenges might be going forward? Um, look, the, the, the challenges haven't changed much since uh, I graduated. Like I, I look back at the last 25 years, uh, the typical, uh, even if it's over, over said in the media, uh, terms like glass ceilings. And recently they were talking about glass cliffs or glass ledges. Uh, these are definitely repeated so much that we have tendency to, they have tendency to lose meaning, but they haven't disappeared. So the glass ceilings are still there. And these unconscious bias that, you know, such as gender stereotype, what a woman's supposed to do, what kind of career a woman's supposed to undertake. She's supposed always to put family first at the expense of her own growth. Uh, she's supposed to be the one that made the sacrifices. And we saw this during COVID when both you know, mom and dad stayed at home and the kids had to do remote learning. It was women who left their careers to be able to support the kids at home while the males continued with their job. And even this is as recent as three years ago, it was really women who took the most brunt of COVID and we lost a lot of women after COVID. Now, they are coming back right now. I'm looking at the numbers. There, there is a large number of women going back, continuing their careers post COVID. But it was always the woman expectation that the woman will make the sacrifice. So all of these are still happening. We haven't, so the so for the generation behind me, I would say we have still a lot of work uh, just you know, solving for current problems. And within the next 10 years, uh, with the you know prominence of AI presence, the type of jobs that women will still be having and how will they be affected by the AI, I think, well, all the traditional problems we have also to take into account the new types of problem that you know definitely will start appearing with the with the AI uh, impact. So there is a lot to take on. That's why that's why I was advocating for daily messaging because it hasn't like we haven't we, there has been some impact, but the numbers are still very far from where we want them to be. Yeah, I think um, you know 
even if in a particular family unit the perception is not that you know if you've got a, a a father and a mother even if in that family unit the perception is not that the mother is required to take the time um <clears throat> i would say that it's fair to say that still across broad society there is that perception in the majority and i think it's really important that you've raised not only what is that perception those challenges still exist they might look different today than they did before but those base challenges are still there and then as we go forward and <clears throat> some of these biases are rigid constructs that we've been talking about today will show up in AI as well and how AI makes decision make uh, you know how decision engines are operating as well so all important points um for those who are coming up in the next generation as well as for those of us who are working today and for those who have you know moved into the next chapter of their of their journey um well let's say let's leave with our last question which is um let's say that we do have um women who are considering who are coming into this ecosystem today and and ready to enter the field on digital trust and identity maybe that's through technical areas policy driven areas business driven areas what advice do you could you share for um women beginning their careers who are coming into digital trust and identity today Look, it's it's definitely a great a great uh, career uh, and especially space to be in uh, and I do believe that women, by their nature, they are more uh, suitable for jobs around uh, trust. Uh, I do believe that this is definitely more innate to us. Uh, this is part of female values. Uh, for for women entering into this space, I would definitely maybe to to, to maybe just write two words, but they they meant a lot for me. Be authentic. Like be yourself. What what does it mean? Be authentic, is that? And this is sometimes really not not uh, explained clearly. But sometimes when we start our careers or our life, we spend a big bunch of it hiding, hiding because we want just to be part of the of the group. We want to be like part of the corporation. So we 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 like to be. Um, more conform to the rest, like by by looking like the rest, by dressing like the rest, and like adopting the same opinions, adopting the same outlook on things. What I would say is that we need less of that and more of your authentic you. So voice yourself, voice your concern, voice your vision of the world. We have already everybody else's vision. Uh, we need new voices. We need new visions and we need change. And this cannot be brought up by the previous uh, rhetoric or the previous thinking. We definitely need fresh and authentic voices. So, and I would believe women are very much suited for such roles in specifically in digital trust and identity. And they are by nature more protective and more, more conscious and more trustworthy. So I would say, be yourself, bring more of yourself, more of your voice. And, you know, uh, that the, the wisdom would be also like whatever worked before to be more resilient, more adaptable, more open and, you know, uh, and let, let shine, allow yourself to shine in this space. Like nobody needs you to hide. You're not serving anybody by hiding. I would like to see more women raising their voice, be authentic, be themselves, be present, be everywhere, be loud. Uh, like we're not serving anybody by hiding. I think just sh shining more and bringing more people to the light is is definitely serving everybody much more. I love this so much. And I was listening to some materials recently about um the differences between a someone's true self and their role self, the role that they're playing. And the closer you can get um, being closer to your true self versus the concept of the role is going to bring you more more peace in your life is going to bring you more stability in your life and uh so i think this this being authentic um i think i also heard you talk about being big taking up space taking up the room uh all part of being authentic and and certainly uh you have been since i've known you a very authentic person very committed person very passionate <clears throat> so uh, this comes across 
from you and what you do with complete authenticity. And I've, I've shared with you before, I'll share with you again today. You, you are one of my inspirational characters <laughs> within this ecosystem. So uh, you're a role model for, for, for myself as well. And, you know, the work that you do and the, the passion and the auth that authenticity that you bring um, is something that inspires me and I know inspires others as well. So thank you again, Fadwa, for taking the time for this conversation today and for bringing your authentic self to uh, to this conversation and to everything that you do with 137 and in this industry. Thank you, Fadwa. And thank you, Johnny, also for bringing your light to Dayak and, you know, shining, being present everywhere, being a voice of wisdom and of, you know, a compass for all of us. And like, definitely you're showing the way you're leading and your leadership is is uh, very inspiring as well. And for me as well, you're my role model. So please keep shining, <laughs> keep being everywhere. And hopefully we can affect some real changes in the digital identity landscape together and having our both female and male colleagues working all together to affect some positive changes. Thank you, John. Thanks for joining us, Fadwa. Thank you. That's a wrap for today's episode of Trust Talks and Digital Dives. Your support means the world to us. If you found today's conversation insightful, subscribe so you'll never miss an episode. Help us spread the word by sharing Trust Talks and Digital Dives in your networks. So until next time, keep exploring and keep delving into the world of digital trust. <music>